Today we are wrapping up this sermon series that has been called Pointers, which asks the question, how do our lives point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? So if somebody was really trying to figure out what your life was all about, what my life was all about, if they watched how we interact with our children and youth, if they listened to the words that we say and how we say them, if they saw the people that we hung out with the most, if they followed us around and clocked how we used our time, if they heard how we prayed, if they observed how we serve our church family, would they know without a doubt that Jesus Christ is the one that we honor above all else? Could they tell by looking at our lives how grateful we are that Jesus has saved us from being slaves to sin on earth and has saved for us a place in heaven, and would they know that he holds the final authority in our lives as our Lord? And for the most part, these things can and should be able to be seen and heard in our lives if we are truly disciples of Jesus. So how are our lives pointing to him as our Savior and as our Lord so that others could look at our lives and be directed to him as the source of all that we want and hope to be. It's much more, folks, than just being a nice or a good person. I mean, a, a non-Christian can choose to be a nice or a good person, but followers of Jesus Christ should be exhibiting so much more than that, especially in times of pressure, in times of trial, and in times of trouble. Disciples of Jesus Christ are consistently exhibiting qualities that reflect the character of Jesus Christ. As I said in, in week four of these, this series, that we want our lives, we should want our lives to make Jesus Christ as plain as day for all who have eyes to see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words you've given me to speak now would glorify you would make your word clear for us, would help us all to love you more and desire to follow you in every way, every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, as we wrap up this series, we are going to look at what God's word teaches us about the use of money, how we view money and how we view the use of money as a way of pointing to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. And this is the one pointer, folks, that is not naturally observable uh, in our personal lives because for most of us, the way that we view the use of money and the way that we use money is something that is very private to all of us. I mean, usually nobody outside your household is standing over your shoulder watching how you balance your checkbook and, and what, you're sh what you're getting when you're shopping at Target or when you're ordering something online. But that does not mean, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we are not accountable. It doesn't mean that we are not accountable just because other people don't know how we are using and spending the money that we have. How we live our lives 24-7, knowing that our Heavenly Father knows and sees all things, is of utmost importance, brothers and sisters. So as his children, we should want to please him. We don't want to disappoint him. We want to please him, not because we want something from him, but we want to please him because of everything he has already done for us. So, here's the question. Do you view this as money to be spent on something, or do you view it as God's provision for you? Do you view it as money to be spent on something, or do you view it as God's provision for you? Something that you, you, you view it as something that you can pay a bill with, you can go to the grocery store with, you can buy a shirt with it, or do you see it as God's provision for you to use as God's word directs? So let's review what the word provision means. It is the action of providing or supplying something for use. You can see the synonyms there. An amount or thing supplied or provided. These are nouns then. Provisions could be facilities, services, resources, solutions, assistance, allowances, opportunities. 
as a verb, to supply with food, drink, or equipment, especially for a journey. Think about if you're going to go camping, that you've got to take your provisions with you. We have a team leaving on a mission trip. Their, their suburban is going to be full of things that they know they need to take for their week. Or set aside an amount to set aside an amount in an organization's accounts for a known liability. Provision can be a noun or verb. Now, look with me at Psalm 24, 1a. Short little verse, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And if you believe that the Bible is true, which is our, our number one core value here at this church, that we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and the absolute truth. If you believe the Bible is true, then that verse, the earth is the Lord and everything in it, then that verse unquestionably, unquestionably means that God himself is the one who provisions us with provisions for the journey of life. That God himself is the one who provisions us with provisions for the journey called life. In fact, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it means that only God gives us what we need because God himself is the distribution warehouse. God himself is the distribution warehouse. Now, I'm not saying that the specific couch that you sit on or the specific TV that you watch or the specific phone that you have in your pocket came directly from God's warehouse. I'm saying that the means that you have to purchase it, the money that you use to buy these things came directly from God's hand because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So let me ask the question again. Do you view a $20 bill or do you, do you view money as, as something to be used to buy something, to be spent on something, or do you view it as God's provision for you? If you view it as God's provision for you, then doesn't it make perfect sense that we would want to follow his lead on how to distribute it? So let's take a look at some passages of scripture. First, Luke 12, starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? I think it means to count God as our riches. To count God as our riches, not the things that we eat and drink and wear and the homes we live in, the cars we drive, the trips we are able to take. These are not our riches. To be rich in God is to count God as our riches. And the cool thing about that is that anybody can do this, whether you, you know, have many acres and many barns or whether you live in a one-room apartment with a car that has 250,000 miles on it. I mean, both people as recipients and distributors of God's provision can be used mightily by God to produce eternal fruit for the kingdom. Perhaps I think it would help to hear that passage from uh, the message. So just listen again. I'm not giving you the words on the screen this time. Just listen to the story, and I'm going to... Um, I'm going to jump down to where it says about the parable. All right, so then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific crop. He talked to himself, saying, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. And then he said, here's what I'll do. 
I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll gather in all my grain and goods and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. You've got it made and can now retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. Just then God showed up and said, fool, tonight you die and your barn full of goods, who gets it? Then what happens when you, that's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. Hmm. That's what happens when you fill your barns with self and not with God. Now, listen to, this is from 1 Timothy 6. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather set their hopes on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life, that really is life. And then one more from Luke 12. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need, and this will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. You've heard that many times before. For where the treasure, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So God's word is telling us, and I think bottom line, that having money to pay our bills, to take care of our needs, and yes, even to take care of some of the wants that we have is not a bad thing. That money by itself is not a bad thing. But the love of money, and it's a, it's a heart and a mind that is constantly yearning for the next thing, for the thing that everybody else has, to thinking about what else you're gonna, what else you're gonna buy as soon as you get your paycheck, constantly thinking about maybe how to make more money because no money is ever no, no amount of money is ever enough it's it's that sort of a mindset that pulls us away from the view that money is god's provision for his people to distribute in ways that he knows that you and i can make the biggest impact for the kingdom so back in august I received an email from Ben Raber, who is the director of Network Ministries in Chambersburg, a ministry that we have supported as a church, and Ben's been here and has preached for us. Um, usually when Ben sends me an email, he's telling me about a need that they have at Network, but this time he was telling me about a personal need, uh, about someone who used to work at Network and someone that he knew John and I had a long-time relationship with. He was asking for help for a young woman who 15 years ago stepped out on a very large limb to help someone who ended up leaving her alone on the limb. Our friend had co-signed a college note for someone that she was trying to help find her way in life. And our friend ended up with the college debt all by herself because this other person just walked away from all of the responsibility. So over the last 12 to 15 years, only a few people knew that our single friend was trying desperately to follow God's call in her life. She was working in ministry settings, usually low paying ministry settings. She was working in restaurants as a waitress. John and I, we would go to an event and there she was working for a caterer. It seemed like she was always working. She was being responsible to meet her own financial needs and also paying down this debt that had been laid on her. 
In the meantime, our friend, just in this last six months, had been accepted into the Allender Center program in Seattle, Washington. It was something she felt called to apply to. And the mission of the Allender Center, which is part of the Seattle uh, School of Theology and Psychology, the mission is to foster redemption and healing in individuals and couples and communities by helping them tell their stories with awareness and integrity while also training leaders and professionals to engage the stories of others with courage and artistry and care. They are committed to boldly engaging the impact of trauma and abuse on the human heart, providing healing and teaching to individuals, couples, and communities, and training professionals to listen and enter into stories in a way that facilitates the transformation and hope of the gospel. Now, I wanted to just lay that out for you because that is a beautiful mission and a much needed mission in this very, very broken world. And anybody who knew our friend knew that this was a perfect, absolutely perfect match for her. So um, Ben, um, in this email, said, you know, here's the goal. I want to raise enough money to pay off this friend's debt so that before she flies out to Seattle to go to the Allender Center to fulfill this call that God has in her life, I'm, I want us to try to raise enough money to pay off this college debt that she had taken on. The balance was $27,500. And that's a lot of money. And we had five days to do it because God had just laid it on his heart. He, he, he hadn't thought of it two weeks ago or a month or two months ago. It, God had just laid it on his heart, so he sent emails out to and talked to all the people that he knew loved this dear woman. So John and I received this email in the morning before we were both getting ready to head out the door, and we read the facts, and we talked about an amount, and we wrote a check, and I delivered it the very same day. And apparently, a whole lot of other people did the exact same thing. In five days, $30,600 was raised to free our friend from a debt she was quietly trying to pay on her own because she was too embarrassed to ask for help, feeling it, that it was her own fault that she had co-signed this note. Now, from our human perspective, we say $27,500, that is a lot of money. But when God is the holder of all things, the earth is the Lord and everything's in it, right? When God is the great provider, when God is the distribution warehouse, then no amount is too big or too insignificant for him to pass through his people to the ones in the greatest need. The key is to find the right people, right? The key is to find the right people. The key is to find the people who are truly disciples of Jesus Christ who don't view money as a means to their end, but view money as a means to God's end. Did you catch that? Boy, that's important. So our friend wrote a letter to those who gave, and here are her words. And you'll see up on the screen a picture, and she took this picture and then she put the words over it, but she said, the attached photo was taken just a few blocks from my school's waterfront location on my first day of orientation, a day I never thought would be my reality on account of the debt I had once carried. The sailboat represents me on my journey of following Jesus' leading like sails follow the wind. I have felt numerous times God's confirmation that he has called me to be here in this place, in this space, at this school and in this chapter, and I have all of you to thank for carrying my burden that weighed me down for so long, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Together. Friends, to one whose pride and shame and identity and self-reliant crutches have made receiving even small gifts difficult, your act of extravagant love has so graciously forced me to receive with open arms and heart casting all of my vices aside. And I am keeping them open in a posture of receiving as we are to live with our Father, the giver of all good things. I don't know to what sacrificial extent your giving was for each of you, 
but I know that God is proudly and joyfully celebrating the foolish giving of his children at the wonder of your love for me and the breaking of chains your love did in my life. Now, why would I share this lengthy story with you about someone that you don't even know? I'm pretty sure God led me to share that with you because of the picture that it provides for us. It's a picture of people all over the world who are burdened, burdened by a consuming focus on money, either because they don't have enough or because they are addicted to having more than anybody else. And it's a picture of people who are freed from a consuming focus on money and who are at the ready to give as God directs them quickly and generously as God has given to us. We love because he first loved us. And so we are careful, church, not, in to get, not to get into so much debt that we aren't free to give quickly and generously when God calls us to do so. We're careful to meet our own responsibilities. And we are aware of what is filling our barns. God or self? And this is why God says to us that we are to give to him, back to him, 10% of the 100% that he gives to us. It's a way of reminding us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He allows us to keep 90% of the 100% that he gives to us. So this past week at a ministerium meeting, we had Pastor Wayne Hall with us, pastor of the Dry Run Church of the Brethren. And I think many of you know that uh, Wayne has been dealing with cancer, and he is now in remission, but he is um, still having to take chemotherapy treatments every other week. And it's really been a tough, a tough season for he and for his wife, Diane. And he said to us, um, the fellow pastors, he said, you know, people have come to me and they've said, well, aren't you angry with God for, for, for making you go through this? Um, and with tears in his eyes, Wayne clearly told us how he replies. He says, God doesn't owe Wayne Hall anything. He has already given me everything I need by giving his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. If that's where our heart and mind is, that God doesn't owe Megan Boozer anything. That God doesn't owe, put your own name in there. God doesn't owe us anything. For he has already given us everything we need by giving us his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me. So that means, if our hearts are there, that when, when people look at the way that we're raising our kids, if they're looking at the way that we are investing and managing our time, they're listening to the words that we say and the words that we don't say, if they're looking at the friends and the marriage partner that we're choosing, they're listening to the way that we pray, they're looking at the ways that we are serving our church family and looking at the way that we view and distribute money that God provides for us, then when they're looking at our lives, then our lives should clearly and consistently and boldly point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. May it be so for me. May it be so for all of us. More and more and more as God gives us the days to continue to live out the ministry he's given to us. Amen, church? <laughs>